Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. That's no? a yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a yes. Uh, so I think, yeah, Aiden has already done our introduction. Do you yeah. want to add anything to it? Just, uh, those are our Twitter handlers, so feel yeah. free to... If you have any us. questions or anything, that's us. And so we begin with a, an introduction from very far away, actually, from when the internet was born. Um, it was born to, it was an idea from scientists to, to share documents and they were, um, they were collaborating, exchanging idea, keeping up with the research other scientists were doing. And it was purely uh, textual, there were no images. Uh, so basically from the start, the design had to catch up because it was not there at the beginning. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is not a new issue. It's very much ongoing and it was there since the beginning. Um, so the thing is, uh, while technology is progressing really fast, um, design is not. Uh, so some websites still look like they did in the 90s. And no offense to anyone, but Digital Scholarly Edition to me, which I'm not from the, digital, from the humanities, I worked um, in advertising. Uh, they looked very outdated most of the time, so out of fashion. But it is improving, so that's a good trend. Uh, so that's uh, Anna Maria and I, we identify that as a, as a problem. Um, maybe not as big as this one, but still. Um, there is, we're trying to fit content um, in a box that doesn't actually contain this, this content very well. So we, what we propose is a different approach. Um, it's content focused and content driven. Uh, it's trying to build the wrapper, the container around it, uh, rather than trying to fit the content in an existing box. So, it needs to be flexible and sustainable for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Yeah, and so probably, um, we strongly believe that digital scholarly editions um, serve the same agonies as uh, uh, also, um, other web uh, uh, resources. And because they are highly sophisticated and technically advanced digital projects, um, so they should uh, serve the same uh, agonies around their content design, development, uh, also uh, their information architecture, and all of them around the framework of sustainable planning. And this is um, the topic that we're going to discuss here today, and we're going to um, um, just elaborate on a few ideas and uh, mainly uh, develop some proposals uh, that we've been working on. So, um, the main topic is that um, this is the main framework of a product development, let's say, uh, 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 idea. So, what's fixed and what can be flexible? Usually time, cost and features are the, um, are the variables and um, we, I think that, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with those two different approaches. So the pure, let's say, kind of old-fashioned uh, approach is a wonderful uh, methodology, um, which really, really falls shortly. It's like a methodology for product development, um, because it tries exactly to feed um, a kind of uh, flexible content into fixed size box, so the features. Uh, and uh, you see that the variables is the time and the cost, and we try to fix them uh, into a very close and uh, fixed sized box, which are the features, rather than build a custom container around the content, which is the opposite from the Agile methodology. Uh, the Agile framework um, suggests, and it's also very close to, let's say, real life projects, uh, because it, it Time, it uh, tries to build uh, a framework that allows, let's say, um, more uh, uh, flexibility in the idea of the features that are going to be built <coughs> around the fixed cost and time. Uh, the idea is that, it, as you see in both uh, frameworks, we are not going to we are not negotiating the quality 
Uh, so we are always uh, looking forward to a quality minimum viable product um, that also uh, it's, uh, it's also the center of uh, attention in both models. Uh, let us speak a bit uh, about an, um, I don't know how many of, we, of, uh, of us here are familiar with Agile approach. So uh, let me um, give you a very quick historical uh, uh, framework. So Agile is an iterative approach uh, framework to planning and uh, let's say guiding project processes that support a more flexible and uh, more, di more dynamic approach to development by assigning mainly uh, different priorities to tasks. So this is the main difference um, for, uh, uh, of the Agile development framework. And it was initially uh, started uh, from the software development community uh, in the 60s and established uh, in the 80s as the Agile methodology and also become predominant in uh, the development uh, framework. And um, I think it's, um, if we want to uh, very briefly point out to the main points of an Agile uh, development framework is that it, um, it focuses on uh, incremental design, um, its willingness to explore and adapt. All members of the team are very willing uh, to uh, adapt and also they are also responding to change. If there is uh, technological change or even content change, um, it uh, valorizes the face-to-face -face collaboration. It always focused in valuable product production. Uh, and the main thing is that um, we keep prioritizing tasks, um, as we heard also yesterday in the keynote, um, based on the Moscow approach. So the Moscow approach is, um, is an approach in order to prioritize our tasks. Um, we could see the must is, uh, we put uh, the most vital uh, things that we can't live without, we need to have them. Should is the things that we consider important, but you know, not vital. Could is the nice to have, uh, but not so necessary. And of course, the want are things that, you know, we actually know from the very beginning that they're not gonna make it. Um, and um, let's see how uh, that, uh, how does it, um, how does it look in an actual project, in a <laughs> real life project? Um, so this is a, so this is a, okay, we created like a template. <laughs> it's not an actual project, but let's say that this, this is the project of our talk. Um, so um, here you can see the labels, uh, the Moscow approach prioritization, and we put labels uh, in every single, um, let's say, category of tasks. And uh, Ginesra uh, is going also uh, after to explain you the different categories. This is uh, the framework, um, the workflow that we adapted in the KDO. So we create different categories for resources, requirements, uh, things that are in progress and think, uh, tasks that are already done. So we, we, could, uh, we would label, you know, each of uh, the tasks with, uh, with a label uh, based on the Moscow approach. Can I just add quickly? Yeah. So we adopted Trello, uh, KDL, it's not the only tool yeah, that's, yeah. that's around, obviously, but it's easy to use for us because uh, we share, we, there are multiple people working on, on the same project all the time. So you can drop, drop, and drag and drop uh, tasks and follow who is doing what, uh, what is already done, what is urgent, what it's not, if we're adding things and, and keep track that way. So it works for us, but it doesn't mean that it... Yeah, yeah. it's it just a choice. Uh, it's a choice of a, of a tool. Um, but um, what does it have to do with digital scholarly editions? So actually, um, um, we think that um, it's exactly the same uh, um, agonies that we have in digital scholarly projects. Time and costs are um, often fixed variables. And what we are going to negotiate when we apply for a project or we are negotiating an edition is actually the, fu the, the features, the, the things that we're going to, the content. So we all want to deliver very good quality. Uh, but we all, uh, and also we want our projects to, you know, to keep running even after the funding period. So we think that the main things that we have to keep, uh, keep in mind is that we need to set up an iterative workflow um, and follow, uh, sorry, <laughs> and follow a very, um, a very flexible evolutionary process in order to meet uh, uh, 
the different tasks, also prioritize different tasks uh, instead of naming everything as to do. Um, focus on this idea of incremental design and user-centered user uh, driven development and also um, uh, allow, us, allow ourselves this, um, this dynamic adaptation to, to content uh, but also technological change uh, and also of course keep documenting uh, you know, your processes but don't overdo it. Um, and uh, yes, yeah. So we apply the. Um, uh, we have adapted the agile method quite recently. Um, so KDL actually is a spin-off of the DJ in DH department at King's College, and we started a year ago. And from then on, we started. Uh, we trialed out the agile framework, and it's working well so far for us. But we did um, develop our own um, workflow. Uh, this is a simplified version. Uh, the, the complex one is scary and uh, useless for the presentation. So, uh, it's, uh, on this one, you, you will see some a mix of uh, goals, products, roles, maybe, um, and actions that we take during the six phases of, of the whole project. So um, the first one, the pre-project, is really an exploratory uh, phase when we talk to the project partners and we find out what we can offer to the project, what, what they want from us, uh, if we're interested, if they're interested in what we do. Uh, and then if uh, we, dis we both, both parties decide that um, are interested, then we move on to the feasibility, where it's gonna be, there's going to be an outline uh, of what the project is going to look like. And, we start prioritizing, so discovering how can we split this work uh, between the roles in the lab and who's interested in doing what. Uh, again, if it's good, move on, foundation. We start producing documentation, so we have a proper documents that it's gonna become a signed off quote that we previously did in the feasibility. Um, and then we start planning the increments, uh, which are gonna be, basically, we, we will design uh, iteratively. And that allows us in the evolutionary development and the deployment, when it, which are the two phases where the actual work, work happens, um, to discover faults early in the process. So we try to evolve with the project. Sometimes uh, the, par the project partners, are, we start with them while they're still working on their data set. Uh, and that means that sometimes they find out that they want to do something else with it, and if we, if we know that soon enough, then it's easy to adapt, and it's the change that Anna Maria was mentioning earlier. Uh, the last phase is the post project. Uh, we, as KDL, don't have that much to do with it. It's usually the project partner that assess whether the product that they got was um, met the, the benefits that we previ previously agreed on. Um, so, yeah, next. How does that work? Uh, so the content is what we make it, uh, we base our decision on. Um, and obviously that's the center of the attention and we start building around it. Uh, and the first thing is create a database or the pro project partner might already have a database that looks like this, uh, which is not really friendly to look at and not easy to understand, especially for someone who hasn't worked on a project as a scholar. Uh, like this, for instance. Um, so, so what we do, we start our iter iter iteration here, uh, and we make it more human-friendly, I call it, and after Stan stock yesterday, maybe we'll move it from the whiteboard to a table, I don't know. Um, so we start, uh, what we try to do with, uh, with this space is try to engage with, um, with the project partners to find a common language, uh, because we, we do speak to different languages, whether it's technology and design against scholarly, academic interest. They're slightly different, and it's natural, but we need to find a common ground uh, to communicate, otherwise we don't understand each other. Uh, and feedback is really important from the beginning, because the more uh, we both feedback to each other, the easier it is to understand and build upon. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an example of a feedback that I got based on actually it's exactly this whiteboard. Um, 
So the, the project partners went on and did their own version, which was very helpful for me because uh, it allowed me to understand the different categories they were working on. Uh, so we worked together and then I started iterating the design and we ended up with something like this, uh, which is not the final version yet. Uh, but everyone seems pretty happy now. And can I just share the, <laughs> I need to share this. Okay, so the insert smiley emoji here, uh, it, it was my way of being very geeky and the design technological part of it. Anna Maria being the scholar read that uh, we, we built a, we brought the presentation collabor in collaboration on Google Slides. She saw that and she put a smiley face image there <laughs> just to show that we have two different languages and two, two different way of interpreting things. But because we were talking often, it didn't make it to the, yeah. to the final slide. And we're so happy. Yeah. That, yeah, we're happy. We're happy. Yeah. So this is an example. And we focused on the users. We got people trying uh, to use the form. I still think we, we can improve this whether, if we have the money. Otherwise, we, we will live with a product that works. Uh, and it has all the must that was defined in the priority list. Um, so, what does design for you? It's supposed to get your content across, get more people interested in the research, using the data, collaborating, giving feedback, possibly co contributing uh, to the research and moving it forward. Uh, it makes it accessible for the same users and users experiencing it will feel rewarded and part of your project. Well, that's how I like to think about it. Text versus visual. I, um, I often experience uh, projects which are very text heavy. I work on a lot of uh, prosopographies, uh, which, yeah, are a list of people. Um, and there's no visual there. Uh, it doesn't mean the text is wrong, but sometimes adding visuals will help make it quicker to get some, I don't know, some references uh, going back and forth. Uh, forth. Um, navigating the database and stuff like that. Uh, but sometimes you cannot make something visual and just you need text. So this is an example. We have, um, we have this uh, Roman Republic prosopography and we have to display the relationships of the various um, records. Uh, obviously Julius Caesar is one of the most interesting because it's Julius Caesar. Uh, and we have the text version, it says exactly the same thing that you have on the images there, but you get more information from the images. Uh, you can get the direction of where the relation was recorded, so if it was in the source where Julius Caesar was mentioned, or if it was Mpea. Um, so for, I don't know, for citation, that might be good, um, but for a web experience, this might be better. It's up to the people working on the project to test it and see what is it for, where are we using it, and who's the target? And does it include every data that we want to include, or does it need to? But obviously, for instance, I wouldn't put a picture of Julius Caesar there. It's unnecessary, it's not required, so text is fine. Uh, this is another example. It's um, probably it's not digitally scholarly edition, but it shows really well what you can do if you let the user choose, uh, if you have the chance to give an option. Uh, we have a, a record of pageants across the UK, and for some it might be useful to know where they are, and for some others it's just the list. It's good enough. Uh, so what we did is, let we could afford to do this, so we let the, the user choose, and they can still use the same facet uh, across the two displays, it's the same data set. Data set so. Let's see the addition as well. Sorry? Let's see the addition as well. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is an example of an actual scholarly uh, edition of the, um, the work of Chopin. So, there is a project, uh, Chopin Online, and it started a very long time ago, 2003. Uh, and I wasn't even working in digital humanities then, so I had no idea um, what they were doing with that. But it's, it's interesting, they are collecting all the editions of Chopin Online. And as I said, it was a long time ago, so it looked like this. Um, which means that you end up on a page, when you want to look for something, you end up on a page that has a massive white space that doesn't tell you anything. And the interesting bit is happening on the sidebar on the left. Uh, you don't even have a free text search, so if you don't know what it's about, how do you do it? You start opening this bit, 
and maybe you know where they are. You start clicking on it and you finally get an image. And I mean, all the data is there and it's essentially the same data we were working on, but what we thought is maybe we can do something with it and make it, well, I have to say maybe this one was done when there were smaller screens, so it didn't look as bad, but it didn't scale. So what we started doing, it's something like this. You still have the same organization of the data, if you wish, but you're giving already few options to the users, few more options to the user, and in three clicks, you already have, you can look for more information on the witness. You know that you will be able to select by instrument. You have a list of <coughs> other facets that you can apply, and then you get a list of images that you can preview before picking one, because with the previous one, you got an image, you didn't even know if it was the right one, so you had to go back and forth. Uh, so this is an improvement, and uh, it came through iterations, and we, did a, we even did a user engagement exercise which helped us, uh, for instance, the preview, which sounds really obvious now, now that it's there. It wasn't there before the user engagement exercise. Uh, yeah, so another example, we didn't get to re redesign this, so this is still there. Um, it's a massive set of data of another prosopography, the people of medieval Scotland, and either you know what you're looking for, or you will be scrolling a very long page of names, roles, dates. Um, it's unfortunate because it's rich. It's incredibly rich and it shows a lot of things, but it might not get the, the user engaged as you wish it would. So what are the challenges for uh, us? Yeah, things like raise your hand if a project that you're working on or that you've been worked on uh, had not set back from start to finish. So, so you're not forced to do iterations back and forth and back and forth. No hands? Everyone? No one? Oh. Oh, one. Yes. <laughs> well done, sir. Okay. <laughs> um, so yes, I mean, what we actually wanted to raise is a couple of challenges. As I remember yesterday, Aidan and uh, Ellie raised, I mean, I think that we are here just to raise issues and just to explain our, um, you know, our challenges. So I think that, of course, uh, we need to find and or even create this common language. Um, I think we, we struggling, I think that we, yeah, we're really supporting that we, we need to adopt and embrace the agile philosophy from the beginning, from the start of the project, and, this, and just um, uh, familiarize ourselves with this iteration and this iterative design, and also uh, try to keep the communication channel inside the project uh, open all the time, and try to include content design and this idea of information architecture in the project and really early in the process of building uh, your edition. And uh, yes, pretty much Thank. as this. So um, I don't know if anyone saw the, saw the movie. I saw it when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you feel that they will come. It's a baseball thing, but yeah. Um, I would add, if they like it, they will use it, which is what you want them to do. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that's us. So.